rise as you are able and be called to worship. Listen, God is speaking. Do you hear? Does a parent speak to a child? Aren't you the children of God? Children of God. Speak, O Lord, we will listen. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and give thanks in it. Please greet one another as the children come forward. Thank you. Where should we sit? You should sit right here. You, Sammy will slide over a little bit. And then we're going to Well, Sammy can slide over a little bit more. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, kids. How you doing? Come on. Come on, pumpkin. It's okay. You can come with her. Come on down with her. Yeah. All right, well, we've, we're going to open this box. We have a box with a mystery in it. Yeah. It's okay. And what we do is we shake the box. Is, is it okay to shake the box? Yeah. Okay, we shake the box and see if anybody can guess what's in it. <gasps> Listen careful. It doesn't make much noise. No, no, Who thinks they know what's in here? Anybody want to guess? No. Well, let's see, then I'll open it up. <laughs> <laughs> the anticipation is amazing. <laughs> Ready? It's up here. It's not nearly that funny. <laughs> it's a purple letter O, right? It's a rubber band. Oh, it's a rubber band. <laughs> it's a rubber band. Well, it's not just a rubber band. This has got fabric around it. That makes it rub there's a rubber band inside the fabric actually. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. So it's rubbery. What do you use this for? My hair. Your hair. So this is a hair band. Yeah. You have one back here, don't you? Let's see, let's see everybody. Turn turn around so everybody can see. Purple. See, there's another purple one. <laughs> yeah. And your hair looks very pretty this morning, by the way. So we can use this rubber band. So I could put it on my hair, right, and make a ponytail? <laughs> I'm having trouble. Your hair's too short. My hair's too short. Or too gone, one or the other. <laughs> yeah, I, I could do it on my beard. No, that's not going to look good. How about you put it on your ear? I put it on my ear. How's that? Yeah. My father told me when I would say something really, really dumb. He would say, you'd better be careful because that rubber band that holds your ears apart is going to snap. And then what will you do? Go to the hospital, right? Would you fix my rubber band? <laughs> so, rubber bands. We can do tons of things with rubber bands, can't we? I often tell couples when they come in to see me for marriage counseling 
that their spiritual relationship is like a rubber band. And I want you to think about it. When you hold a rubber band on your fingers like this, can you feel it? Barely. I mean, it doesn't weigh anything, right? Because your fingers are together. But when you pull it like this, can you feel the rubber band? Yeah. yeah, you can, can't you? And so you can feel how strong the rubber band is as you move apart. And that's kind of like our spiritual relationship with one another. When we're apart from one another, we feel the love that draws us back together. And we can feel the strength. And that's kind of how it is with God, too, sometimes. When we're feeling God's presence in a powerful way, we can, we can feel that closeness, but we also know that, that when we're apart from God, that God is always drawing us back together. God is always drawing us back into God's presence. That strength that God has pulls us back. So think about that when you put on your rubber band. It's kind of like God's strength pulling us back. Should we say a little prayer? Fold your hands. Say, thank you, God, for always pulling me back to you. Help me, Lord, to feel your love. And help me, God, to love other people like Jesus loves me. Amen. Now, today, children, we're going to go down to the fireside room for Sunday school, and then we'll be coming back for communion so parents can pick up your kids back here. They'll be in to join you for communion later in the service, okay? All righty, you guys have a good time at school. And we will stand and sing our hymn. Be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Northridge United Methodist Church. My name is Allegra Wilson and I'm the Director of Communications and Young Adults here at NUMC. Please take a moment to register your attendance in the red booklets at the end of every pew. We love knowing you're here. 
This Wednesday, join us for spaghetti at Soul Food Cafe at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. It's going to be wonderful as 6 p.m. here in the sanctuary with the music of Janice Anderson on vocals, so make sure not to miss that. Eat Out Monday will be at Maria's Italian Kitchen just down the street next Monday, and make sure to take a flyer with you. Maria's will donate a portion of the proceeds from your meal to our Family Ministries program. You can get your flyer on the website or in the office. Sign up now for an appointment at the Red Cross Blood Drive next Monday between 1 and 7 p.m. You can help save a life. The Polynesian Luau is around the corner on August 16th at 6 p.m. Get your tickets now and join us for an amazing evening of dance, food, and fun. You can get your tickets in the office. That's it from me. So I was going to do this joke about how many people does it take to screw in a light bulb? And it's a great joke, and, it, and it's got all the different denominations in it. You know, how many Baptists does it take to screw in a light bulb? And how many Catholics? Is, and, and I kept going through it, and I realized, you know, well, but I, I can't do that one because so-and-so's family's Catholic. And I, and I can't do the one about the Mormons because I know that there's a, a, a Mormon relationship family church. And I can't, can't do the one about the Presbyterians because the, so I, you know, I couldn't tell the joke because it would offend somebody or other. So, you know how many Methodists it takes to screw in a light bulb? <laughs> We're not sure the General Conference hasn't issued a, a statement. <laughs> But they're meeting in 2016 and it's on the docket, so we'll find out. Every uh, August for the last several years, I've done a series on Methodist, Methodist history. And uh, I was trying to cast about what I wanted to do this year. When on Easter Sunday, a young boy who had attended once before, I think last Easter, came with his parents and after church he came down front and he said, I have a question for you. And I said, sure. And he said, why do you have a microscope on your door? And I said, well, let me tell you. <laughs> so we walked back to the door and we looked at the microscope. How many of you have seen the microscope on the door? How many of you have no idea what I'm talking about? <laughs> Good. This sermon series is for you. If you walk through our doors, you'll see these panels. Okay? Recognize those panels? These are the doors. If you came through the center doors, right there, turn around and look. There they are. There are four panels. And, let's see. Oh, I got a pointer. Okay, there's a dove here, and a book here, and a microscope here, and a ship here. You walk through these doors every Sunday. Do you know what these symbols mean? Well, stick around. For the next four weeks, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> This week, we're going to talk about experience. And experience is the one that looks like a dove. Okay? Because the experience of God is often referred to in the Bible as a descending dove. When Jesus is baptized, the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus in the form of a dove. Dove symbolizes the peaceful presence of God coming into our lives. And so that's why in that panel we have a dove. These four things are what we call the Wesleyan quadrilateral, named after John Wesley. And there are four things that we are invited to do as we create our theology. Methodist theology is unlike any other denomination you'll find in that we don't have any dogma. 
It's not like the Roman Catholics who've got a pope that tells you how to think. It's not like the Calvinists. It's not like anybody else. Wesley said, I want a people who think. And so Methodists are encouraged to think and do their own theology. So everybody's theology is going to be a little bit different. And it's going to be a little bit different, especially because of experience. But the four things are experience, tradition, reason, and scripture. And scripture is obviously the biggest one. I tell people it's not like a four-legged chair. It's more like a bar stool with a really big center, <laughs> center leg and then three stabilizing legs that go around the outside. That big center is scripture. And the three stabilizing legs that hold up and stabilize the, the stool are, script, are tradition experience and reason. So today I want to talk about Wesleyan quadrilateral experience. Now, all of us experience God in a different way. Because all of us have traveled a different route to get here. We've grown up in different places. We had different parents. We had different schools. Fell in love with different people. We've traveled different roads. And God travels with us on those roads. And the relationship we have with God is going to be different because as God speaks to us in the midst of those travels, our experience of God will relate as much to the travels as to the nature of God. And so our experience is a key ingredient. And the best way for me to talk about experience is to talk about this man. Who knows who this is? Nobody? Okay, I'll give you another clue. Who knows who this is? He's an organist. Albert Schweitzer. You probably know him in this way. Albert Schweitzer was one of the most amazing men of the last century. He was a brilliant theologian, a brilliant organist, but then he decided that God had a call on his life. He gave up all of that, went back to medical school, and gave his life to being a missionary in Africa. 200 miles from anything remotely looking like civilization, he set up a hospital for the poorest of the poor and served there the rest of his life. Why? Because God called him. God called him. His personal experience of God was that he wasn't just to sit at a keyboard and play glorious music. He wasn't just to sit at his desk and write great theology. God called him to be a servant. Now, back in the days when he was a great theologian, he wrote an incredible book, The Quest of the Historical Jesus. How many of you have read this book? Anybody? If you have not, you might want to write this down. This is still, I'm sure you can find a copy in the library. It might even be online. The quest of the historical Jesus is Schweitzer trying to unpack all those scriptures and make sense of it in a way that talks about who Jesus really is. How do we find out who he really is from scripture? And then Schweitzer discovered, you can't. Jesus isn't just in Scripture. And so he wrote his book, but he also wrote this paragraph. And I, The reason I'm using the screen today is because I want you to read with me. We're going to read through this paragraph bit by bit. So would you read with me the words on the screen? He comes to us as one unknown without a name. As of old by the lakeside, he came to those men who knew him not. He comes to us. 
Jesus comes to us. And just like the man on the road to Emmaus, who did know him, in his lifetime they knew him, and yet on the road to Emmaus, they don't know him. They they have no clue. And as they walk, he gives them clues. Clue after clue after clue. He describes himself. He describes the Old Testament prophecies that talked about him. He describes himself in a way that they should get it, and yet they don't. Or the men by the lakeside. Who are the men by the lakeside? Those four fishermen, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, that Jesus walks up to as they're, as they're mending their nets on the seashore and says, follow me. And they drop their nets and follow him because they think that there's a different life to be had following Jesus than just pulling in nets and catching fish. Jesus speaks to us every day. The question is, are we listening? Are we aware? Jesus comes to us as a stranger. Sometimes in the midst of your life, you've felt an urging. You've heard a voice in the back of your head. You've seen an event where you felt the power and presence of the holy. You've stood watching something and your skin is tingled. Your eyes have watered. You have felt the presence of the holy. And you probably didn't say to yourself, ah, Jesus is touching me. You probably just said, Wow. And sometimes that's enough. But I invite you to recognize that in those moments of wow, part of what's happening is that God is with you. You are being touched. You are being spoken to. You are being blessed by the presence of the Holy. Jesus is holding your hand, guiding you, speaking to you. God comes to all of us. And we don't recognize him in the beginning. Read with me. He speaks to us the same word. Follow thou me. And sets us to the tasks which he has to fulfill for our time. What does he do when he calls Peter, James, and John? He says, follow me. They are to become his disciples. Now, disciples is a big word. We use it a lot in the church, disciples, discipleship. Doesn't mean anything beyond student. To be a disciple is to be a student of a master. Jesus calls us and says, follow me. And his intent is that we are his students. In effect, he is the master of a trade that we need to learn. And when we learn a trade, we've got a lot to learn, right? How many of you take on new things, like to learn new new trades, new new hobbies, new, new, uh, you know, gardening? Linda's trying to figure out how to raise orchids, you know? She's really, really good with African violets. Orchids are a mystery. Whole new thing to learn. We become disciples and students 
And when you become a student, you, you go into it knowing that you don't know it all. You go into it knowing that, that this is somebody who has knowledge you don't have. One of the problems for the church, I think, is we like to think that we do. It's embarrassing for us to admit we don't know. The biggest stumbling block for people to go to Bible study is that they don't know their Bibles. You know, we, we open Bible studies all the time and people drag in and they finally admit, well, you know, I decided to take it because I really don't know what's in the Bible, but, you know, I'm supposed to believe what's in the Bible. And that's just terrifyingly embarrassing. And yet, most people I know who sit in pews have never read their Bibles and outside of the scriptures that we read on Sunday morning, which are just snippets, we really have no idea what the whole thing says. And it's, it's quite a volume. But here is Jesus. He's not only going to teach them the scriptures and interpret them to them. He's going to teach them how to live. He's going to teach them how to be in ministry. He sends them out at different points. He sends them out as 12 to, to preach the word and to heal and touch. He sends out 72 at one point. He says, I'm going to send out an even bigger group. Why? Because they've been at, at his knee long enough that they're now able to go out and do some of what he's been doing. Preach and heal and, and touch people and teach people about God. And so they go. And after he is crucified and after he has left the, the 12, which becomes 11, which becomes 12, they go out into the world and they do amazing things because they were students once and now they are the teachers so Jesus calls us and those who respond are those who are willing to admit I need to know this I really I really need to know this it's something that's important I need to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and learn what he has to teach me. Read with me. He commands, and to those who obey him, whether they be wise or simple, he will reveal himself in the toils, the conflicts, the sufferings which they shall pass through in his fellowship. That's quite a, quite a sentence. We'd like to think that if we become disciples of Jesus Christ, our life will just get really, really good. It'll get really, really easy. There won't be any burdens. There won't be any difficulties. There won't be any toil. We'll just, we'll just accept Jesus Christ and we'll just kind of march on the golden road to heaven. Jesus never promises that. In fact, when he talks to his disciples in the later chapters of John, he tells them, let me tell you what it's going to be like after I'm gone. <laughs> and he does not paint a pretty picture. <laughs> if you're going to be my disciples, you're going to be as abused as I was. Look at all the ways that the scribes and Pharisees have abused me in my ministry. You think it's going to be easy for you? No, it's going to be hard for you. It's going to be harder for you than it was for me. But... I will be with you as you go I will be with you and that is how we learn about the nature and the presence of God in the midst of our toils in the midst of our trials in the midst of our troubles God speaks to us and guides us through them and we prevail against them we overcome them because the power of Jesus Christ is in us and alongside of us and we are in his fellowship keep that in mind when the troubles come in your life that Jesus is in your fellowship and he is with you and he will never abandon you
as disciples. I often think about disciples who are in an art gallery. Disciples of a guy who throws pots. You ever watch a disciple of a potter? Oh, it's a sad thing. How many pots fail? (laughs) How much clay gets ground up again? How many times does the master come and say, that won't work? (laughs) And the disciple just feels like a complete idiot. But doesn't quit. Okay, I did something, it failed, I'm going to learn from it. Teach me how to do it better next time, Lord. And the master teaches. And so we fail, and we struggle, and we learn a new thing, and we do it better the next time. The thing that drives me crazy about the political process in America is that we expect our politicians to be perfect. Think about that for a second. Anybody here expect their politicians to be perfect? Severely flawed people. I mean, if you're running for office, you're just, you know, you're just psychologically suspect from the beginning. But the press takes them apart when they discover they've got skeletons in their closet, they've made mistakes in their past. I'm just waiting for some politician someday to stand up and say, well, I was growing up. I made mistakes. Gosh, I made lots of them. Would you like a list? Here, I've got a bigger list over here. And I learned from them. You're not electing the person I was 10, 15, 20 years ago. You're electing me today. And I guarantee it, I'm human today. And there it is. I'm going to do the best I can. You'll help me. We'll move forward together. They don't say that. They try to act like they're perfect. And so we far too often try to act like we're perfect, project this image that that we've got it all together, that we're perfect. Dear friends, don't try to be perfect. Try to be disciples. When you throw a bad pot, break it. Start a new one. When you make a failure, march on. When you're going through difficult times, keep walking. Like Winston Churchill said, when you're marching through hell, keep marching. (laughs) Read with me. And as an ineffable mystery, they shall learn in their own experience who he is. Schweitzer wasn't a Methodist, but that sentence in a crux is how experience touches Methodist theology. We each learn in our own experience who Jesus is in our lives. And so Methodists are a tremendously broad and diverse group because we have all traveled different routes. You've heard me say before, Dick Cheney and Hillary Barodham Clinton are Methodists. They could be sitting in the same pew next to each other and be proud of being Methodists, even though they are not in agreement about a whole lot of other stuff. But as Methodists, they understand all of our experience and all of our thought process are going to be different And that's part of the beauty of God's creation. And the beauty of who we are as Methodists. We embrace our differences and we say, look at how great God is to create all of these different people with all of these different thoughts and walk with all of these different people on all of their different experiences and not have to make them the same. And so we're different and proud of it. (laughs) We learn in our own experience who he is. This man really didn't intend to start a church. But John Wesley had his own personal experience. Wesley started what we call the Methodist movement, which became, after the revolution, the Methodist church in America. 
Wesley was a notable failure at just about everything he tried outside of college until one day he went to a Bible study. He had failed in America. He had failed as a local church priest to the point that no one would let him preach in their, in their churches anymore. And then he went to Aldersgate Street. Would you read with me? In the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. About a quarter to nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for my salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. We learn through the things we experience. When we make a bad pot, we are forgiven. When we make a bad mistake, we are forgiven. When we fail to be good disciples, we are forgiven. And God loves us still. This is what it is to know and understand the place of experience in Methodist theology. Everyone is invited to encounter the living Christ and come to this table and receive the blessings which God holds open to all. And that's why Methodists have an open table, why we serve communion to the children, why you don't have to be a Methodist to come and receive communion. Whatever your experience of God is, if you desire this day to commune with Jesus Christ, like those at Emmaus, to sit down at table and have Christ break bread with you, you are welcome. And as you come, if you would like to remain for a few moments in prayer, you are invited to kneel at the kneeler and be in prayer. Would the servers please join me at the table? Let us pray. Most gracious God, we come to this table not because we feel that we are worthy, because we in fact feel unworthy. We know that we've made terrible mistakes in our lives. We know that we don't deserve to come. And yet out of your great love for us, you invite us and you place us at seats of honor and you surround us with that love as we come and commune with you. And so, dear Lord, we ask that as we come, that you would fill us with the blessings of your Holy Spirit, that we might experience your love in our lives each and every day in countless new wonderful ways. That as we break this bread and take this juice, we might open our lives again to receiving Christ in new and wonderful ways as we walk down this road together. Amen. Remember how in the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body broken for you. 
take and eat. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup and having blessed it and given thanks for it, he gave it to them saying, this is the cup of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you take it, take it in remembrance of me. And so we come to this table and ask that God will bless these elements, that the Holy Spirit of Christ might be in them, and that we might sup with him in this day. Amen. It is our tradition to receive this meal by intinction. You will be invited to break off a piece of the bread, and as you pass the cup, to dip the bread into the cup and receive it in this way. Jesus Christ broken for you, take and eat. The blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you take it, take it in remembrance of him. you come forward with the invitation of the ushers.
May we stand for the affirmation of Pentecost. We believe in God, the primary creative force since the world began, who sent Jesus and his Holy Spirit into the world. We believe in Jesus Christ, who lived among us and taught us God's ways, who died our death and rose for our salvation. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the presence and power of Jesus poured out at Pentecost, the unifying tie that binds Christ's church as one. We are the people of God. We are the Northridge United Methodist Church, inviting all people to come into the presence of God, welcoming all people into the church of Jesus Christ, going forth with a mission to change the world. Amen. Good to have Joseph back. <laughs> Dear friends, go forth from this place. And as you go, go in the presence of God. Go with your eyes open and your ears hearing that God may speak to you and show you new things. Go forth into a life in which God will go with you every step. And as you go in the presence of Christ, change the world. Amen and Amen.